I'd like to mention right now uh, those that we are aware about in regard to uh, issues that uh, we like to address uh, with prayer. And so I'm going to mention those names right now, if I may. Uh, let's keep, if you would, please, in prayer, uh, Sister Kathleen Washington. Also, uh, the Coxham and Brown family on the loss of a, a family member. Also, if you would, please, let's remember uh, Ross uh, Thomas, who has some uh, medical issues we've discovered, and our prayer certainly uh, will be that God will bless him and bless him in a mighty, mighty special way that things will work well. Uh, let's keep also in prayer uh, Jennifer Brown and her family on the loss of her uh, mother-in-law. Uh, also, uh, Oliver Brown, let's pray for Oliver Brown, uh, James Latson, uh, Doris Latson, uh, John Jenkins, uh, uh, Sheila, uh, Wanda Williams, and as we understand, uh, her, her mother is in rehabilitation. She's in New York. And I believe Wanda and Randy will be going to New York sometime this week, so let's pray that things will go well uh, uh, for them on their travels. Also, uh, let's keep in mind uh, Brother J.K. Hamilton, minister out in uh, Texas, uh, lost his uh, brother-in-law, his uh, wife's uh, brother. So they funeralized, I believe, uh, their brother-in-law on yesterday. Let's keep them in prayer. Um, also, um, let's keep in mind uh, Brother uh, Melvin uh, Sepp, uh, who has uh, been dealing with a, a transplant in regard to his lungs. Uh, let's keep in mind uh, also uh, Leslie Redding, if you would please. Also, Sister uh, Mona Freeman, uh, as she's recovering. Uh, keep in mind also, if you would, uh, Janie Bailey, we'd like to pray for. Also, um, uh, there's, a, there's a brother that has had some difficulties in running into an odd situation. Uh, his name is uh, Nate Johnson, I believe it is. Let's keep him in prayer. Uh, awkward situation, not a good situation, but nevertheless, uh, we believe God is able to handle any issue, any concern, any pain that occurs in our lives. Uh, let me ask you again, Tony, who is that other person? Lost his who? Oh, okay. Let's pray for J.K. Hamilton to preach himself. Uh, I understand that he's ill. Uh, let's keep him in prayer. Also, understand that uh, Brother Alvin Daniels uh, lost an aunt that they funeralized on yesterday. Let's keep Alvin uh, and family in prayer. And also, I understand his son is in uh, the hospital. Uh, dealing with the COVID issue. So th there's a lot of things going on. And certainly as we witnessed this past uh, week, our country certainly needs uh, 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 God's help. And so let's pray for our country. Let's pray for the government that somehow, some way that they will allow God to intervene and guide their hearts and guide their minds. No matter how many laws we have in the book, it, 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 it does not matter if we don't have the kind of hearts that will respond in such a way that they recognize that there is a higher being, a higher standard than the standard that we supposedly are accustomed to living by. And so if you would, let's do our, our best to pray on behalf of those that we at least tried to mention uh, this day. Let's pray, everybody. Dear God, we come to you because we are aware that there is no being that is able to handle every situation that can ever come before us. And so since we recognize that, we, we also recognize that you're going to do what's best for us. You're going to not show any kind of favoritism, but you're going to deal with us as you see fit. And so we come to someone that's just, someone that's honest, someone that will provide mercy for us, and someone who has the capability of making those things that are a suspect, hurtful, and painful in our lives, uh, you can make a change, you can make a tremendous difference. And so right now, dear God, we come asking you in regard to those that we have just mentioned, we pray for uh, Jennifer Brown there, God, that you continually bless her and her husband, bless that family with some comfort on the loss of a loved one. 
We pray also, dear God, for the Oliver Brown, uh, James Lapson, Doris Lapson, the John Jenkins. I believe all of them are, are connected somehow. They have various issues, and you know every one of those issues. And so we ask you, please, to touch it in a, in a very special way, dear God, with your mercy, with your kindness, and certainly with your love. We pray also for Shayla, dear God. Whatever the concern is there, you know exactly what it is. We don't have to know, but you know. And so we come to you, dear God, to, to ask you to, to bless her in a very, very special way. We pray for uh, Wanda and Randy Williams, especially in regard to uh, uh, Wanda's mom. We pray that you will help her in her recuperation, that you give her the strength that she stands in need of. And if Randy and Wanda are able to uh, travel to New York, we certainly ask you to, to give them that, that traveling grace. Allow them, dear God, to be on the highway, uh, uh, get to their destination, find things well, and be able to also return home safe and sound. We also pray, dear God, for uh, J.K. Hamilton. We understand that he's not doing well. Our prayer, dear God, is that you touch that preacher, that you give him the things that he stands in need of. And certainly with the circumstances and around to the, the loss of the loved one and their family and his wife, we ask you please to bless them and bless them also in a, in a special way. We pray for our brother Alvin Daniels, dear God, and we ask you to bless his family and the loss of a loved one and certainly also a son. We ask you to do the things for them, that, God, that certainly they're not even able to do for uh, themselves. We pray for Leslie Redding there, God, that you continually aid her, that you uh, comfort her, that you be with her, her husband Moses as they work together through uh, their physical struggles in this life. We also pray for uh, Mona Freeman there, God, that you bless her, bless her family, uh, give her also uh, the things that she stands in need of. We also pray to God for Janie Bailey, dear God, that you bless her, that you comfort her, uh, that you help her to remember that you are alive and well. You see what's going on in our lives, and, and you can make a difference, and you will make a difference in our lives. We pray certainly, dear God, for uh, Gail's dad, uh, Mr. Moore, dear God. We ask you to bless him as he is in recovery, that you do for him what he can't do for himself. We also pray for uh, Ross Thomas, dear God, that you bless him. Whatever is, is going on, especially with whatever procedures, whatever things that need to be done, our prayers to God that you will make it happen, that you'll do for him what he's not able to do for himself. And then again, dear God, we pray for the uh, United States of America. Yes, we, we are aware that all the whole world needs you, but right now in particular, dear God, I touch the hearts of those, the, those, those, those callous hearts, the, the, the situation that certainly brewed up and has been festering for a long time. What I am so happy about is that you are, are aware of what's going on. It didn't take you by surprise, and so for some reason, you allow that to happen, maybe to grab our attention, to understand that there are some things more important than ourselves. Not even just the, the government, the United States of America, but you most important. And so I will pray to God our hearts that are touched in such a way that they will allow you to work in their lives. Help us to worship you there, God, in such a way that you'll be pleased with. We pray for all those that are listening, that will be viewing, and preferably that will be worshiping with us this day that you grant them all the thing that you see that they stand in need of. It is in the mighty name of Jesus we ask it all and give thanks to you. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. The first song we will sing is My Hope is Built on Nothing Less. We have a book that's 438. We'll sing the first, the second, and the fourth stanza. Number 438. 438. All right, number 438, if you have it, let us sing. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When dark 
darkness veils his lovely face. I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone. Faultless to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the Folly Road Church of Christ Sunday morning worship service. Glad to have all of you that are tuned in and just glad to be here. Nice sound. Our lesson for this morning is going to be found in the book of John, St. John, chapters 4, and the verses will be 20 through 30. Again, that's the book of John. The chapter is four, and the verses are 20 through 30. We'll begin at verse number 20. Our fathers worship in this mountain. Ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus said unto her, Woman, believe me. The hour will come when we shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship ye know not what. We know what, your, what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshiper shall worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. The woman said unto him, I know that Messiah is coming, which is called Christ. When he is come, he will tell us all things. Jesus said unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. And upon this came his disciples, and marveled that he talked with the woman. Yet no man said, What seekest thou, or why talkest thou with her? The woman then left her water pot and went her way unto the city, and said unto the men, Come, see a man which told me all things that I had ever did. Is not this the Christ? When they came out of the city, then they came out of the city and came unto him. That concludes the scripture reading of the book of John. The chapter is four and the verse is 20 to number 30. May God in heaven continue to bless all those that hear and do his blessed command. Let us pray. Our Father, which art in heaven again, Lord, we are so thankful for this day. 
this day that you have allowed us to be alive, to be healthy, to be able to hear and be able to see, be able to carry on the normal functions of our body in this, this world. But Lord, we thank you for even the, the, the spiritual part of us that, that you have given us that we know that we should bless. Uh, we are blessed in knowing that you have taken care of us. You, you're the one that do everything for us. You, you're the one that made us. We, we live and we operate through you. Lord, we thank you so much for all that you've done. And we thank you, Lord, that you have sent your son to die for us, that we might have even to the, uh, the right to the tree of life. We thank you, Lord, that you've been better to us than we could ever be to ourselves. You have done more for us than anyone could. We have blessed us in such ways that we, we, we're yet even to determine or find out exactly how things happen. But Lord, we thank you in advance for all that you plan to do us, and Lord, we are more than grateful for all that you have done for us. Father, we thank you now even for the avenue of prayer that we can pray to you and ask you for things that that we need or we think that we need in this life. We ask you, Lord, to, to help those that are in need of prayer for sickness. We ask you to help them with their afflictions. We, we ask you, the Lord, to even give them the strength to, to endure and even the power to overcome if it's according to your will. Father, we ask you your blessings upon those that are just carried away with, with sin, those that are caught up in things of this world that, that somehow or another they have lost their way, but Lord, we ask you to help them to find their way through Jesus Christ back to the place that they should be. But Lord, we ask you this morning to give us the, uh, the power and the strength to tell the gospel in such a way that those that are lost in sin will know uh, that Jesus Christ still is the way home. Father, we ask you to help us uh, as we proclaim the gospel this morning, help the preacher as he come and pour out his heart once again telling the world about you and your son Jesus, how they should know that, that, the, that there's only one Savior, there's, there's only one God, there, there's one God above all God, and you are the most high God. Father, we ask you to be with us now as we uh, go about our, our business of sharing the gospel with the dying and criticizing world. Help us to do all that we can while we can. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. The next song we'll sing is Trials Dark on Every Hand, number 702. And we'll sing all three. Number 702. All right, if you have it, let us sing. Trials dark on every hand, and we cannot understand all the ways that God would lead us to that blessed promised land. But he'll guide us with his eye, and we'll follow till we die. We will understand it better by and by, oh well, by and by, oh, when the morning comes, I'm telling you all the saints of God are gathering home, and we will tell the story how we overcome, and we will understand it better. By and by, oft our cherished plans have failed, disappointments have prevailed, and we've wandered in the darkness, heavy hearted and alone. But we're trusting in the Lord, and according to his word, we will understand it better by and by. Oh, well, by and by, oh, when the morning 
thing comes. I'm telling you all the saints of God are gathering home and we will tell the story how we overcome and we will understand it better by and by. Temptations, hidden snares often take us unaware and our hearts are made to bleed for some thoughtless word or deed and we wonder why the test when we try to do our best we will understand it better by and by oh well by and by oh when the morning comes i'm telling you all the saints of god are gathering home and we will tell the story how we overcome and we will understand it better by and by oh well by and by oh when the morning comes i'm telling you And we will tell the story how we over. And we will understand it better by and by. Amen. Again, God has been very kind to us, allowing us to be numbered with those that are living. Uh, for some reason, he has done that. And we are very grateful and very uh, thankful that he's thought enough about us to allow us another chance uh, to be numbered with those that are living. We ask you please to open your Bibles to the book of John, John chapter 4. And we like to use for a, a subject, a, a, a thought uh, this day, and that is a challenge uh, to worship. A challenge to worship. Let's check the book. In the book of John, John chapter 4, around verse number 20, we find these words. Our fathers worship in this mountain. And ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship you know not what we worship, what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. He says we know what we worship, but the hour cometh. Now is when the true worshiper shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. A challenge to worship. I think we need to I try to go back for just a, a little while. You know the story of why this woman would ask such a question at this time. In John chapter 4, around verse number 4, the Bible says that there is a must needs that Jesus go to Samaria. And so from the start, there is a hint that there's something amazing, very special, that's going to occur in the city of Samaria. When Jesus gets there, the Bible says, around verse 5 and 6, that he is tired and he, and he sits on the well. And the Bible says, 
while sitting on the well, a, a woman comes there. And it's very hard at this time because it's, it's noon. And oftentimes the Bible says, according to Genesis chapter 24, around verse 11, the time that women normally come to fetch or get water is around evening time. So she comes in a, a very hard time suggesting that uh, she's coming there uh, because perhaps of uh, certain circumstances in her, in her life where it's not good to, to be around even if she could. Perhaps she's been run off from other women because of her reputation. And so in John chapter 4, if you would, Around verse number 6, the Bible says again these words. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied for this journey, I sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. There cometh a woman, notice now, of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, give me to drink. For his disciples were going unto the city to buy meat. There was the woman of Samaria unto him. She basically says, or comes out and says, How is it that thou being a Jew ask this drink of me, which am a woman, and then I'm at the city of Samaria? For she makes it very clear. For, for the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, if you knew what was available to you, eternal life, and who it is, I, I'm the Savior, the provider of this eternal life. If you knew that, give me to drink, thou wouldst have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. The woman said unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with. And the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? Now, I want you to understand what has occurred here. We have a situation where there are some barriers here. There's a culture barrier. There's a gender barrier. There's a racial barrier. And Jesus is aware of all of us. And so Jesus, because of his graciousness, invited the woman into his world. Here is a hurting woman. Here is a, here's a woman that no doubt is a, is a sinful woman, an adulterous woman. She's a sinner. She has messed up some folks' lives, some families she has no doubt destroyed. But yet Jesus invites her into his life, into his world. And so he begins by using something that's common to both of them. Water. She says in so many words, uh, uh, I don't understand something ain't right here because I'm a woman and study says that especially a Jewish rabbi and Jesus is a rabbi, he's a teacher. Pharisees basically when they walked and saw a woman in the street, oftentimes they were identified as bruised Pharisees because when they saw a woman, they would close their eyes and they would sometimes walk into the wall, church, because of what they thought about a woman. They thought very little of a woman, church, and especially a rabbi, a teacher of the Jews. They had no dealings, no associations. Now, this Jew asked a woman who's a Samaritan, who's thought of by the Jews as, as dogs of worthlessness, for some water. Her response in so many words is, you ain't got nothing to draw from the gift of water. Now notice the issue here, church. Let me share with you something. She is saying to Jesus, you're asking for water, and you ain't got nothing. I don't see what you have to draw water from. And so what she recognizes is basically this, church, that she's the one with the bucket. And she is the one with the dipper. And what Jesus was saying to her, I'm willing you, woman, a Samaritan, to draw or, or lower your bucket into the water, bring it up, take the water out, and I'm willing to put my mouth on the dipper. Church, do you see this? He's saying, I'm breaking down barriers. And I want you 
want you to know that I think that much of you that I'll even put my mouth on the same dipper from the bucket shirts. So now her heart is basically open because he's told about some living water. And then the Bible says something odd appears to happen. At least that's what we think more materially. Let me just get down to the point. Around verse 15, the Bible says this. The woman saith unto him, Sir, give me this water now that I must that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. And so Jesus, he, he, he's, he's wheeled her in now, and she's trusting Jesus. She's trusting a Jew who she had thought without question, he ain't even supposed to be speaking or looking at me. But he's telling me about some living water. The Bible says, though, around verse number 17, the woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus saith unto her, Thou hast well said, I have no husband. For thou hast, you've had five, he says, husbands. And he whom thou now hast is not thy husband. In that thou sayest thou true. Then around verse number 19, the Bible says this. The woman saith unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Here it is. Our fathers worship in this mountain. And you say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Let's see what we have, church. A challenge to worship. For a long time, as I studied this passage and a number of times, my thought basically was perhaps this woman has now been embarrassed so much that she wants to get Jesus off the subject. And, 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 and that possibly could be the case. But after studying and reading more on the subject, we at least know this. We have a woman that recognizes that the person that's speaking to her knows all about her life. She now recognizes out in the open she is a sinner. She's a, a doubter. She has messed up folk family. She is a sinner. She will go to hell. And so perhaps what she's asking now is recognizing in her culture, in her life, that how you get rid of sin is you take and sacrifice to the place where God has designated. And so what she really might be asking here is, where can I meet God? That's the extra church. Where can I take my sacrifice where I can meet God, where he can deal with my sin? And so this morning as we study the subject of challenge to worship, I think all of us need to really consider, are we really worshiping God? Not only are we worshiping God, are we worshiping God in spirit and also in truth? So I think the first place we need to start concerning this, as we look at her question and the response that Jesus will give her, do we really understand what the Bible teaches about worship? The word worship is an Anglo-Saxon word. What we mean by Anglo-Saxon, there were a, a, a group of Germans that came into England and, and, and conquered them. A language occurred, and from this language, when it comes to this word, the word worship occurred and, 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 and resulted. And so the word itself means uh, that which is ascribed concerning someone's worth, someone's value. And so when we're talking about worship, we're talking about what have we assigned, especially when we talk to God, what have we assigned regarding how much God is, how heavy a God is in our life? What does he really mean when we talk about worship? What's the value of God in our life? How heavy is he? What's his worth? And so when we talk about God, certainly we recognize as we go to God that he is superior. 
that there's no body or nothing like God. God is perfect. He can't get any better, and sure enough, he can't get any worse. He's perfect. God is sovereign. That is, he doesn't need anybody or anything. He is self-sufficient. God is all-powerful. God knows everything. God can be every place at the same time. That's the God that we worship. He is heavy in our life. He ought to be heavy. He ought to be of some value. And so, for the next few moments, I'd I, I like us to look at some expressions. Some word pictures about the idea of what is involved in worship. For if we're going to worship God, we ought to have an understanding of what's involved, what's the meaning, the understanding, what goes on when we truly worship God. Let's check the book. In the book of Psalms, Psalms 45. Around verse number one. I want you to notice the expression in the words here as the psalmist comes before his king. Let's see what the Bible says. When you think about worship in the Bible, especially in the New Testament, one, one Greek word uh, uh, jumps out at us, pronoskia. What that has reference to is a bowing down. A kissing of the hand of uh, 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 someone with a ring on, someone that's superior to you. A recognition of, 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 of prostrating oneself to show without question, I recognize how small I am and how giant, and how superior you are to me. And so as we look at some expressions concerning what is involved with worship, let's start here. In Psalms 45, around verse number one, the Bible says these words. My heart is indeed a good matter. I speak of the things which I have made touching the king. My tongue is the pen of a ready writer. What is he saying? He is saying that I'm overflowing with gratefulness. Under the recognition that I'm under somebody, and that's you, Lord. Now, here's the point, church. Overflow, the idea here, the word that I just used, has a reference to bubbling over. It's like a pot. And so the idea in worship, at least part of the idea, is that we are overflowed. We are overjoyed. It's spontaneous. Nobody got to prime me if I'm truly worshiping God. It automatically comes up. David says in the Psalms, 23 around verse 6. My cup, he says when he thinks about God. My cup does what? It runs over. And so as we look at another expression that shows the eye there in mind when we talk about what worship means, let's continue to check the book. In the book of Ephesians chapter 1, around verse number 6. What's involved with, with worship? Let's see what the Bible says. What kind of idea can we get? In the book of Ephesians chapter 6, chapter 1, I'm sorry, verse number 6, the apostle Paul writes and he says these words. To the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted, he says, in the beloved. And so the idea here is church, that when one worships, he is worshiping in a restful understanding and relationship that he is right with God. He recognizes that he has been redeemed. He's been justified. He is sanctified. He is a child of God. And so when one worships, there is no threat here. It's understanding that the God that I serve loves me. And I am truly a child of God. When we think about the idea of worship, Let's continue to check the book. In the book of Revelation chapter 4, around verse number 11. Revelation 4, around verse number 11. Watch what the Bible says. Revelation 4, around verse number 11. John writes and he says, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. What's the idea? He's saying, there was nothing in this text that referred to 
any blessing that God gives me. Nothing in this passage has reference to talking about my needs, my wants, but everything was centered on God, on Jesus in particular right here. What are we saying here? We're saying that worship is an occupation. That is, my business now is all about God. Him seeing and receiving the glory and honor that's due him. It's all about God, not about me. When we talk about worship, let's check the book. In the book of 2 Samuel chapter 12, 2 Samuel chapter 12, around verse number 20. Let's see what the great book says. 2 Samuel chapter 12, around verse 20. We're talking about a challenge to worship. In 2 Samuel 12, around verse 20, the Bible says this. David has become an adulterer with Bathsheba, killed his, her husband. She is pregnant. She has a child now, a newborn. The Bible shows that God takes the child, doesn't let the child live. Watch what David responds is. The Bible says, then David arose from the earth and washed and anointed himself and changed his apparel and came into the house of the Lord and he worshiped. The idea here is prostrating, bowing. He did not get angry with the Lord church when Something occurred that he recognized he had a repentant mind. And so when we come to the Lord and worship, we ought to have a mind that's a repentant mind. That there's of anything that is not right that we have done in our lives, that our hearts and minds have changed as we go to God about it. In Job chapter 1 around verse 20, you're talking about a challenge to worship. In Job chapter 1 around verse number 20, Watch another picture, word, scripture, picture of what's involved in worship. Let's check the book. In Joel 1, around verse number 20, the Bible has these words. Job had just lost everything that was of any value to him, other than his wife and his health, which would soon also disappear or be taken out of his life. When he got the news about all his children dying, all his wealth leaving him, the Bible says around verse 20, then Job arose and rent his mantle and shaved his head and fell down upon the ground and he worshiped, he worshiped. And so worship also involves the understanding that I might not understand what's going on in my life. I may not even like what's going on in my life, but I'm going to honor God. And then in Genesis 22, a challenge to worship. You know the story. God has come to Abraham and he said to Abraham, I want you to sacrifice your son. I'm talking about the beloved son, the one that you, that you love. And he says around chapter 22, beginning around verse number 1, watch what the Bible says. In Genesis 22, we begin around verse number 1. The Bible says, and it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham. He tested Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, behold, here I am. And he said, take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah. And offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee. Watch what the Bible says. Verse 3. And Abraham rose up early in the morning, saddled his ass, and took two of his young men with him, and Isaac his son, and cleaved the wood, for the burnt offering, and rose up and went into the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day, Abraham looked up his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder to what? To worship church. He recognizes that what's involved in worship is there might be a price to pay, church. 
There might be something that I give up or must give up that's very dead to me, but I'm going to prostrate. I'm going to bow. I'm going to kiss the hand. I'm going to show God that it's worth the sacrifice. A challenge to worship. In Isaiah 6, around verse number 1, Let's see what the Bible says, Isaiah chapter 6, around verse number 1. A challenge to, to worship. Let's check the book. Isaiah writes and he says, In the year that King Isaiah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne. He was high, lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twin, he covered his face, and with two, he covered his feet, and with another two, he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord. That is God is is separated. He is different. There's nobody like him of the host. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the, the king, the Lord of hosts. Then through one of the serpents, and I'm having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. And he said, oh, I'm sorry, and he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. Watch this. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I. Send me. And so worship involves a sense of awe of who God is. And also a consciousness that I ain't worthy to even come before this Lord. It's a recognition that there is some forgiveness that's needed and I need some cleansing. And it makes me recognize that if there's anyone that can go for the Lord, hell am I, send me. And so when we talk about our subject, the challenge of worship, we need to understand again what what worship involves, what it is. But let's go back to the text and see what we might discover as we try to hastily go through our text. And so we have a woman that has been told everything that she has basically done. She recognizes that she's not right. In her culture and her religious atmosphere, what's required to get sin right is a sacrifice. And so perhaps what she's asking is, how can I find out where I can place the sacrifice where it ought to be? And so the Bible says again around verse 20 on, watch what the book says. Our fathers worship in this mountain. And you say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus saith on earth, woman, believe me. The hour cometh when you shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship you, you know not what you worship. You're, you're really ignorant of what you, what you worship. And then and, and, and studying this text here is that the Samarians were limited in, 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 in their knowledge of God. They only I kept the five books, the first five books, the Pentateuch. They didn't get the information of what the prophets would say about Jesus, the coming of Jesus. They, they lacked some things. And also the beauty of the Psalms, they did not have that, did not accept that. And then he says in verse 23, but the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshiper shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Let's talk for a while, church. Let's, let's talk about worship for a while. Since COVID-19 has 
grows on the tree. We now, for the most part, don't come to the church building to worship. Some folk are going back gradually, but for a long time it was law that you would not go back into the church building. And so thank God there, there were some other avenues, some other ways, as we're doing right now, that we can screen and put people in a position where they can still worship God. I heard this question asked from some preachers on a panel. And the question was asked, are our people looking at worship? Or are they really worshiping? Let me say that again. Are our people looking at worship? Or are they really worshiping God? I thought that was interesting. Because if we're not careful, all we may be doing at home is looking at what's going on. And that's why it was important for me to try to give us some sense, some idea. I was involved really in worship. When this thing first started, this thing, this COVID situation, and, and the streaming, the virtual worship, I heard, not saying Father Road, but I, but I heard of folks still being in the bed with their cover over the head, peeping out, looking at the worship, still dressed in pajamas, still eating, still carrying on their morning business during the time of worship. What am I saying, church? I'm saying that we need to understand what's involved in worship. It is not looking at what we're doing here, church. And as we study the Bible, we have tried to provide the atmosphere, provide uh, uh, the, 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 the channels in regard to how we express and show our worship in our giving, in our teaching and preaching where folk can meditate on what's being said in our singing, in our, in, in our giving. And so I asked the question, are we looking at worship? Or are we really worshiping? What I want to share here very quickly, that we can worship at home. We sure can. Let's check the book. Nothing wrong with that. Let's check the book. In the book of Acts, chapter 2, round verse number 46. Let's see what the Bible says, Acts 2, verse number 46. Let's see what the great book says, Acts 2, around verse number uh, uh, 46. Listen to what the Bible says. In Acts 2, around verse 46, the Bible says, And they continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house that eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. And so some folk were in the temple, in, in the areas in the temple. They worship, but they also worship House to house. Let's check the book. In Acts chapter 5, around verse number 22. Listen to what the Bible says. Acts chapter 5, around verse number 42. Let's see what the great book says. In Acts 5, around verse 42, the Bible says, And daily in the temple, and in what? Every house, they cease not to teach and to preach Jesus Christ. Let's check the book. In the book of Romans chapter 16, I believe around verse number 5. Let's see what the Bible says. Romans chapter 16, around verse number 5. Let's see what the great book says. Paul writes to the church at Rome and he says this. Likewise, greet the church that is in what? In the house church. Salute my well-beloved Ephesus, who is the first fruits of Acadia and the Christ. What am I saying? Bible showed that folk were in the house when they worship, when they study God's word, when they preach, they were in the house. So it's not wrong to be at home worshiping God. Nothing wrong with that. But let's make sure we understand something. When we're able to come back, we need to do our best to try to come back collectively. What I'm saying is this, that 
We find Bible examples of folk worshiping, teaching, and preaching Jesus in their house. And so what we're doing right now, we don't see any biblical error in doing it. But we also must admit and point out that it was God's design that the people of God come together. Let's check the book. In the book of Hebrew, if you were chapter 10 around verse number 24, let's check the book. Hebrew chapter 10 around verse 24, and what we're trying to say is we're encouraging folk when we're able to come back. We ought to come back. God wants us to come back. Let's check the book. In Hebrew chapter 10 around verse 24, the Bible says this, and let us consider one another to provoke, that is to stimulate and to love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. As the manner of some is, but exalting one another, and so much the more as we see the day approaching. Now, in study, we're not certain what that day means. It could have been meant the service. It could have been the coming of Jesus back. It, it, it doesn't matter. The, the point is that the idea is for us to be together, encourage one another, to stimulate one another, to, to elevate one another. That cannot be gotten at home. Let's check the book. In the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 11, again, I want to show you the idea that it's God intended that folk come together. That was the practice back then. Let's check the book. In the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 11, if you would, around verse number uh, 17, let's see what the Bible says. Now in this that I declare unto you, I praise you not. Now watch this, watch the expression, that you come together, the idea that they were coming together. He said, but when you're coming together, because you're taking the Lord's Supper wrong, he says it's not for the better, but for the worse. But the idea is that they came together. Verse 18. For first of all, when you what? When you come together, where? In the church, in the assembly. I hear that there is, there be divisions among you. And I, and I partly believe it. For there must also be heresies among you. That they which are approved may be made manifest among you. Here it is again. When you what? When you come together. Therefore, unto one place, this is not to take the Lord's Supper. Not the way you're eating. This can't be the Lord's Supper. But the idea is a coming together. There's a purpose for the coming together. Let's check the book. Colossians chapter 3. Around verse number 16. Let's see what the great book says. Colossians chapter 3. Around verse number 16. Paul writes to the church at Colossae. And he utters these words. He says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your heart to the Lord. What's the point? He was saying that this is to be done among you, church. Yes, we sing. I, I pray that folks at home are singing, that they're participating in the Lord's Supper, that they have given that they are meditating on the word. I, I'm praying that that happens. The point is that the idea was for that to be done among the Christians as a collective group church. And so my point is, when we're able to come back, don't Salaam says the preachers already taught that we can worship at all. Yes, worship can occur there, but the point is when God grants us the opportunity to come back, that's his desire that for us to come. Let me see if we can kind of tie this in here because let's go back to the book very quickly. John 4, verse 23 and verse 24. Here's his answer. She wants to know, where can I find God? Where can I find the place where I, I, I can get my sins dealt with? Watch what Jesus says. He says again around verse 21, let me start there. Jesus saith unto her, verse 21, John 4. Women, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship, you, you know not what you worship. Says salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshiper shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is spirit. They that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. 
And so the answer to the woman is, that's not where anymore. And that says to us, you can worship God at your house. You can worship in the assembly. You can worship in the park as we do sometimes. But the idea of understanding what they're doing in worship, how are you worshiping him? It's not about the where. It's about the how. And he says, this is what's important. When you worship God, worship him in spirit and in truth. We are made up of three parts, the Bible teaches. Spirit, soul, and body. Let's check the book. In the book of 1 Thessalonians, chapter 5, around verse number 23, watch what the great book says. 1 Thessalonians, chapter 5, around verse 23, we find these words. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray, God, your whole spirit soul, and body be preserved blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so the highest part of us taught in the Bible is the spirit. Remember in Genesis 1, 26, we are made in the image of God, and God is spirit. He is not flesh. You can't define him with flesh. And so what he's saying to us, our our spirit, our, our highest part, where God has commanded and ordained for us to communicate with them is how we go about worshiping God. And so that means it's not about what we do with our hands and giving God stuff. Not, don't get me wrong, we, 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 we can express it in giving in, in, in regard to contribution, but the idea is it's not so much about what we give them hand-wise, Let's check the book. In the book of Acts chapter 17, very quickly, Acts 17, around verse number 24. Watch what the Bible says. Okay, here's Paul. In chapter 17 on Mars Hill, he, he utters these words. He says, let me, let me tell you something about this unknown God, the real God. God that made the world and all the things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. He says, God... Like y'all are doing, you got a God here, and you got him housed here, a God here, you got him housed here. He's saying, the God, the real God, he is too big. There ain't no house that you can put him in, no place of worship. He owns the heaven and he owns the earth. He, he, he owns everything. He's too big for a small place like you. But he said, I want you to notice also. Verse 25, neither is worship with men's hands. See, they were carrying stuff and sacrifices uh, to feed and appease the gods in his house. He says, God don't need that. And he says this, neither is worship with men's hands as though he needeth anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things. He says, this God gives you stuff that you ain't able to give yourself. And so when we talk about Worshiping God in spirit, the idea is not so much giving us physical things to God, but giving those things that, that, that the spirit can provide, communi communicate with the Lord. And that is our love, our loyalty, our obedience, our devotion to God. That's, what, that's how we worship him in spirit. But then let me end with this particular, these passages here. Not only must we have a right frame of mind as we worship God, but there is also a way that we study the Bible that shows we must worship them in truth. Let's check the book. In John 17, 17. John 17, 17. Watch what the great book says. John 17, 17. Watch this. In John 17, 17, the Bible says this. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Now, there are some folks that fight about truth. And they talk about one definition, and it is, it has reference to sincerity. But it also has reference to a, a, a concept of, 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 of truth, of, of, of facts. Now, even if that passage in John 4.24 did not mean talking about God's word, even if it did, and, and, and I believe strongly the Bible teaches that. 
There is too much scriptures in the Bible that talk about how we ought to worship God. I'm going to share this passage with you in the left of the show. See, folk can wrestle over a particular passage, but that's when, you, when, you to, when you take in totality all that's being talked about and studied on a particular subject, then you ought to come to your conclusion. And what I'm saying is the things that we do in worship, the channels that we use to express our devotion, our love, our loyalty, our obedience to God ought to be ordained by God in the Bible. Let's check the book. And the book of Colossians chapter 3, around verse 17. Colossians chapter 3, around verse number 17. Listen to what the Bible says. And whatsoever you do in word or deed, watch this, do it all. Watch this now. In the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Whatever you do, worship. It ought to be based on the authority of Jesus Christ. Let's check the book. In the book of 1 Peter chapter 4. Around verse number 11, watch what the great book says. The Bible says, if any man speak, let him speak as the what? Oracles of God, the divine utterances of God. If any man minister, let him do it as the ability which God giveth, that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. Let's check the book. In Acts chapter 2, around verse 42, very quickly, Acts 2, around verse 42. Let's see what the great book says. In Acts 2, around verse number 42, the Bible says this. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and the apostles' teaching and fellowship and breaking of bread and in prayers. 2 John, 2 John, verse number 9. There's enough in the Bible that leads us that whatever we do, it ought to be according to the word of God. Let's check the book. In 2 John around verse number 9, we find these words, 2 John around verse 9. Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the what? In the doctrine and teaching of Christ hath not God. Just that simple. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. And let me leave this last passage with you on this idea. And the lesson is yours. The book of 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Around verse number 6, 1 Corinthians 4. Around verse number 6. Let's see what the great book says. In 1 Corinthians 4, around verse 6, the Bible says this. And these things, brethren, I have in a figure transferred to myself and to Apollos, for your sakes, that ye might learn in us not to think of men above that which is what? Written to no one of you be puffed up for one against another. And so again, our subject today, a challenge to worship. When we worship God, are we looking at worship? Or are we really worshiping God? There might be someone that's not a child of God. And, 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 and and you can't really worship God properly if, if you're not a child of God. You need to be put in a position where you can come to God with the recognition that the God that you're serving approves of you. Not that we're perfect, but he's there for us because we become one of his children. How do you become a child of God? As we study God's great book, the Bible, the Bible says in John chapter 8, verse 24, Jesus says, unless you believe that I'm he, you will die in your sins. He who, he who was the savior of the world the anointed one from God. And then in Luke chapter 13, verse 3 and 5, he says, I tell you nay, except you repent, have a change of mind, that now leads you to have a change of behavior. And then he says, we must confess him. In Matthew 10, 32 and 33 says, if you confess me before men, I will confess you before my Father in heaven. But if you deny me before men, I will also deny you before my Father in heaven. And then in Mark 16, 16, he says, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. And someone said to me a number of years ago, can anybody be saved who does not obey Jesus? Jesus says, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. And so you can wrestle with baptism all you want, but I say again, can anybody be saved who does not obey Jesus? If there's one that desires to become a child of God, again, my number is 843 364 
9836. Give me a call. 843-364-9836. And as we said before, there are other congregations of God's people, churches of Christ throughout the area that will be glad to assist you. We're now going to go into another portion of our service. And that is the Lord's Supper, a channel or means whereby we can express to God and what we're doing of our love, our devotion, and our obedience to our God. In Acts chapter 20, around verse number 7, we find the day in which God's people came together to partake of the Lord's Supper. In Acts 20, around verse 7, the Bible says, And upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continued his speech until midnight. In the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 11, around verse number 23, the Bible shares here uh, the kind of demeanor, the kind of attitude that we need to have, the frame of mind that we need to have when we take the Lord's Supper. Paul writes and he says, For I have received of the Lord that which I also delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, Watch this. The same night in which he took, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take ye, this is my body, which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. After the same man also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Why? For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death. Till they come. Let us give thanks for the bread and for the cup. Dear God, we're very thankful again for the grand opportunity to celebrate by commemorating what Jesus did for us over 2,000 years ago. He died. They buried him, but he got up from the grave the third day. And so we not only uh, cherish and think about what he's done for us through his suffering, but also we recognize that he's coming back. Help us as we take this bread, dear God, that you will bless it as Remember us in regard to it representing his body. And also the cup, the fruit of the vine, recognized to represent the blood that he shed on Calvary for us. Help us to do so, dear God, in a manner that's pleasing and acceptable in your sight. It's in the mighty name of Jesus we ask it all and give thanks to you. Amen. We now come down to another portion of our services, and that is the collection. In the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 16, the Apostle Paul uh, writes to the church concerning a collection to be given for the poor saints in Jerusalem, and he utters these words. He says, now, concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do you. 
upon the first day of the week, let every one of you live by him a store, that there be no gathering when I come. And then he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6 and 7, But thus I say, he was so sparingly shall reap also sparingly. And he was so bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man according as he purposed in his heart, so let him give. Not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loved a cheerful giver. Let us give. Let us give uh, thanks for the contribution. Dear God, we're very thankful that you've allowed us the ability to give something back of what you blessed us with. Our prayers that what we've given and, and the attitude and how we've given it, that's brought glory and honor to your name. We ask you to bless these funds that they'll be used in such a way, again, that you'll get the glory, you'll get the honor, that there'll be benefit to those that are certainly in need of it. It's in the mighty name of Jesus we ask it all and give thanks to you. Amen. We want to, again now, as we normally do, close uh, our service. Uh, uh, and as we close it, I want to uh, just make mention of just uh, uh, one or two other things, and that is, I want you also to pray for my wife. She's been uh, sick battling, looked like a cold or, or, or some, some flu-type some, some flu symptoms. Uh, let's please keep her uh, in our prayer. And let's continue to pray for our, our sister, uh, Wanda Washington, uh, again, as she goes through a, a battery of, uh, of uh, health issues, if you would, please. Uh, let's pray, everybody. Dear God, we're very thankful, again, that you've allowed us the privilege to, uh, uh, to, to worship you. And so we come, dear God, thanking you for all that you do for us. We also ask, dear God, that you be with Sister Wanda Washington, that you bless her, that you aid her, that you give her the strength that she needs as she go. Uh, dealing with the various uh, issues in regard to her, her health. Bless her and bless her in a mighty special way. Also pray to God for my wife that you'll bless her, that you'll aid her, that you'll strengthen her, that you'll help her uh, with whatever's going on with her. But again, thank you that we can say thank you for you are truly uh, awesome is, is, is not an adequate word, but you're all that we need in this life to survive and one day make heaven our home. It's in your son, precious, holy, and righteous name that we ask it all and give thanks to you. Amen. All right, everybody, thank you so very much. I want to remind our men today, we got Bible class, men Bible class at 4 p.m. at the building. And I'm certain that our ladies had a grand and enthusiastic, encouraging, and, and very uh, learning time. And so again, uh, we thank you so very much for your participation and for uh, just being the kind of people that you are. May God bless you all and bless you real good. All right. Uh, I don't know if we're still on air, but I want to certainly acknowledge uh, our, our technical team, uh, Byron and Tony and Sammy, uh, for, for, for making it work 